اوكي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاه والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين uh, distinguished speakers dear colleagues ladies and gentlemen welcome to this workshop on uh, recent advances and reverse osmosis that is organized by the IRC for membranes and water security my name is uh, Sam Al Jundi I am the director of the center and first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Asif, Dr. Nadim, and Dr. Muhammad Yassin for all the work that they have done. Also, would like to thank uh, all of uh, our speakers for accepting uh, our invitations. Thank you very much. Uh, today, we have um, uh, very important subjects to talk about. First of all, Dr. Uh, Professor Tang will talk about novel strategies for overcoming the upper bound of desalination uh, membranes, uh, nanoformed and TFNI membranes. Uh, later, uh, Mr. Vector will talk about present and future of control and automation in water use and desalination. And then uh, Professor Maria Kennedy uh, will talk about assessing bacterial growth potential in seawater reverse osmosis pretreatment systems. And last but not least, uh, uh, Dr. Martin will talk about reverse osmosis, why the solution diffusion model is wrong, why it matters, and how we uh, how to correct it. Uh, our uh, dear audience can ask questions by uh, raising their hands or by typing uh, the questions in the Q and A box. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, go immediately to Professor uh, Tang. Uh, professor Tang is um, a professor of environmental engineering at the University of uh, Hong Kong. He obtained his PhD degree from Stanford University and has approximately 20 years of experience in membrane technology, water use and desalination. Professor Tang is highly cited researcher. He has published more than 280 journal papers with a total citation of 20,000 and an H index of 81, according to the Web of Science. His invention of aquaporin-based biomimetic membranes has resulted in the successful commercialization of aquaporin inside membranes by Aquaporin Asia Singapore. Uh, Professor Tang's R&D has received many prestigious awards and recognitions, such as Fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry, the IDA Water Reuse and Conservation Award for Outstanding Professional, the CAPES uh, Nanova Frontier Research Award by Chinese American professors in environmental engineering and science, the inaugural uh, RGC Senior Research Fellowship, uh, the inaugural HKU Innovator Award, and many more. Uh, without further ado, I would like to give the mic now for Professor Tang. Professor Tang. Okay, I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, let's see. But it says that I cannot do that. Uh, okay. Because I was sharing, yeah, we can go. Oh, on. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> okay, that's great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, good, good morning, everyone. And uh, um, it's my great pleasure to share with you about some thoughts in the uh, in the development of a uh, new type of uh, thin film uh, nanocomposite membranes, or the thin film uh, composite membranes. So basically, uh, uh, what I'm going to touch on will be a bit uh, uh, overview of the upper bounds for dissemination membranes, uh, including nanofiltration membranes and the reverse osmosis membranes, and uh, some thoughts on how to make our membranes more efficient. So uh, we know that uh, water scarcity is a very big problem worldwide. And to address that, uh, many places have started uh, 
desalination programs, water reuse programs. And in the 1970s, in the 1970s, uh, we, this uh, very important invention, um, thin film composite membranes, uh, uh, and uh, later it, this uh, fully aromatic polyamide thin film uh, composite uh, membrane chemistry has been invented. So since then, this has been dominating the market. So up to date, more than 40 years later, we are still using this type of membranes, TFC polyamide membranes. Now, this talk is trying to shed some light. Can we make these membranes better and how? So my talk will be divided into three parts. The first part, I will briefly touch on the upper bound. Uh, what is the, the benchmark or the best performing membranes uh, up to date? And a little bit about this uh, so-called OMD, uh, which stands for Open Membrane Database. And uh, then I'm going to share with you some of our, some of our latest uh, research works in my lab. Uh, one of this is so-called nanoforming. So we introduce gas bubbles, vapor bubbles inside the membrane to, to change, to tailor the surface morphology of the polyamide membrane. And another uh, approach is the so-called interlayered thin field nanocomposite approach, or for short, TFNI. So uh, uh, with this structure is slightly different from conventional TFN membranes in that we introduce a layer of nanomaterials between the polyamide layer and the polar substrate. All right, so uh, let me first um, uh, get to this uh, upper bound. Now, I guess for those of uh, membrane researchers who works in uh, gas separation, they are fairly familiar with the concept of upper bound. Uh, Robertson's uh, upper bound, which is almost like a standard benchmark when you make a new gas separation membrane, you're trying to compare your membrane performance with the upper bounds. So basically, uh, uh, when we make our membrane more permeable, the, uh, typically, the selectivity of the membrane will decrease. So you have this kind of trade-off between the permeance and uh, the selectivity. Now, this type of uh, trade-off behavior, uh, this type of uh, trade-off behavior will also uh, be applicable to uh, desalination membranes. So here, uh, recently we published this uh, upper bound for uh, RO and NF membranes. Uh, here we plot the water permeance in the horizontal axis and uh, this uh, selectivity parameter. In, in this case, we use this A over B ratio to indicate the membrane selectivity um, on the vertical axis. Now, uh, this kind of A and B values are derived from the solution diffusion uh, model. Of course, I, I realized that uh, in, a later, uh, in a later talk, uh, there will be a presentation on why SD model do not work so well. Uh, but uh, I'll say uh, this SD model is still very useful uh, to understand some of the basic behavior of the membrane. So if we follow this SD model, then we can say that the membrane intrinsic rejection is given by the water flux uh, over water flux plus the B value. So in a way you can think about that uh, your solutes are diffusing through the membrane, which is competing with uh, water transport through the membrane. Um, now, since the uh, water flux is proportional to the driving force by the water permeance, so this JW is given by A times the driving force. Now we know that uh, this uh, intrinsic uh, rejection of the membrane is somehow related to this A over B ratio. Now in this plot, uh, we, can, uh, we can divide this uh, region into uh, several bands. So uh, here, uh, this line basically has a constant, uh, uh, this line has a constant B value and it corresponds to a, uh, a rejection of uh, a sodium chloride rejection of 90%. And if you want to achieve a higher rejection, you follow this line. 
Uh, the same plot also summarizes more than 500 uh, published uh, membrane data points in this plot, uh, in, including uh, a lot of uh, lab-made uh, RO membranes, as well as those solid points stands for commercial membranes. So commercial uh, uh, nanofiltration membranes, uh, these blue points are brackish water RO membranes, and there's a red squares, uh, the red diamonds are seawater hour membranes. So this line, this so-called upper bound line, pretty much uh, stands for the best uh, based on all current experimental results we obtained so far. Uh, now, along with uh, some other collaborators uh, from KU Leuven, from uh, Yale, and from Technion, we have uh, been developing an open membrane database. So the idea is that uh, we build a common platform, a public platform, and uh, whoever publish a new paper, they can uh, upload their membrane performance onto this common platform. And as a result, we gather all this, uh, uh, this uh, data point, this uh, database can be further expanded. And this kind of database can help us to do a lot of meta analysis. For example, we can sort the data into different years. So here we can see that uh, uh, over the last 30 years, how does this upper bound has been shifting upwards. Um, now, uh, in addition to the upper bound for uh, our membrane, which uh, primary we are interested in the water permeance and uh, uh, water sodium chloride selectivity. We could also do something similar for nanofiltration membranes. So uh, in that case, not only we have uh, water permeance versus this uh, water salt selectivity, we can also construct a salt salt selectivity. For example, the monovalent to divalent uh, ion selectivity versus uh, water permeance plot. Now, the, the important que uh, question is how can we, what kind of strategies do we have to overcome this upper bound? How can we make a better membrane than the existing state of art? Now, uh, in another review paper, we have been looking through different kinds of uh, membrane materials, membrane structures. Of course, uh, the commercial standard. Uh, nowadays, the commercial standard is the thin film composite structure. Uh, now, uh, the uh, researchers led by Alec Cook at uh, UCLA has, been, uh, has developed a type of membrane called thin film nanocomposite membrane or TFM membrane. Uh, the, their first generation, basically, they incorporated uh, porous zeolite nanoparticles into the rejection layer of polyamide. And they found that uh, they can uh, increase the water permeance without sacrificing the salt rejection. So that's a, a good step. Now, by the way, I use the size of the bubble to indicate the potential of the uh, potential enhancement in separation performance. Uh, in my group, when I was based in Singapore uh, in uh, Nanyang Technological University, I have developed a type of membrane which incorporates uh, aquaporins into the polyamide uh, membrane structure, and uh, uh, we were able to roughly triple the water permeance and maintain uh, salt rejection. Uh, now, on the other extreme, on the other extreme, you can look at this kind of new materials such as graphene oxides, uh, pure aquaporin, or aligned carbon nanotubes or magazines, or for example, 2D uh, cough, morph, this type of materials. Now their potential, their material uh, intrinsic property is very good. However, to make a large scale production, it's very difficult. So most of this kind of materials uh, or membranes are still at the mini archer or bench scale development. The question is, can we do something in between? Can we make a membrane with very good potential, yet we can mass produce these kind of membranes? So uh, next, I'm going to introduce two approaches uh, developed uh, in my lab. Now, uh, before I talk about this uh, nanoforming uh, approach, uh, I'll show you some uh, uh, 
uh, micrographs on the intrinsic structure of polyamide membranes. Uh, so those uh, commercial polyamide membranes. Now, uh, from the surface, uh, the plan view, we can see that uh, polyamide membranes, TFC polyamide membranes uh, have pretty rough membrane surface. And uh, here is the cross-section. And uh, uh, in the cross-sections, we can see some voids, uh, nano-sized voids typically in the range of like, uh, uh, 20 to 100 nanometers in size. So this kind of uh, characteristic, characteristic uh, voids. Uh, if we perform some uh, TEM cross-section uh, analysis, again, we can see this kind of uh, void structures. So indeed, if you look into this kind of TEM uh, cross-sections, you realize, you start to realize the actual thickness of the polyamide, if you excluding those nano voids, the thickness is only uh, in the range of 10 to 20 nanometers. So those uh, polyamide films are extremely thin for commercial R membranes. Uh, now we can also look at the actual available surface. So because of the rough surface, the real available surface for filtration is much larger than the plan area. So if we take this uh, surface area ratio, the real surface area divided by the base plan area. Uh, this ratio can be as high as uh, seven. Uh, some, uh, I read some other papers, they even reported a number more than 10. So if you can get a greater ratio and a thinner film, then in a way you can, you can enhance your filtration efficiency. You can, you can increase your permeance. Now, we basically made a hypothesis uh, on for the origin of this kind of nano voids or the surface roughness of RO membranes. And uh, we look at this interfacial polymerization. So uh, the, the way to make uh, polyamide membranes, uh, TFC membranes, you use two monomers, a diamine monomer and a trimethylchloride. Uh, when they react uh, at the interface of a water solution and the organic solution of this TMC, the water solution of MT, uh, MPD and the organic solution of TMC. So at the interface, they will form this cross-linked polyamide structure. Now, most of people focus on this polyamide, polyamide film, but we also look at this uh, byproducts. This reaction will release heat and uh, uh, in addition, it will release an acid. Uh, so proton, H plus will be released. Now, uh, my training during my PhD study, uh, I was trained in a water chemistry group. So we talk about carbonate chemistry a lot. And uh, by looking at this kind of uh, byproduct, byproduct immediately, my reaction is that if your solution, if you start with uh, a solution with high pH, Note that the MPD solution, the, the uh, pH of this aqueous solution is about 11. So with a high pH solution, you can absorb a lot of CO2 from air. Now, during this reaction, you have an acid released plus you are heating at the interface. So this kind of byproducts will, will somehow react with bicarbonate dissolved in the solution and that will form CO2. And under the action of heating, CO2 will be released. So this is our hypothesis. To validate our hypothesis, uh, we first did a bulk experiment. We mix the two monomer solutions in a, a, volume, in a flask. And uh, we found that uh, this uh, balloon was inflated. So that basically indicates uh, some gas has been pr produced and the additional GC analysis uh, review that uh, CO2 was produced. And uh, uh, so basically here we, our hypothesis is that uh, because of this production of uh, CO2 nanobubbles, uh, so these uh, nanobubbles will form the polyamide layer while those uh, polyamide film are still forming, are still uh, uh, being uh, formed. Um, now, uh, to further uh, confirm our hypothesis, we decided to do another control experiment. We decided to degas 
our MPD solution. So we're trying to remove any dissolved CO2 from the solution. So without changing other experimental conditions, simply by removing CO2 from our MPD solution, we perform the interfacial polymerization reaction again. Now we get a very different morphology. Now this membrane, uh, the surface is much smaller compared to the control membrane, which uh, we do have CO2 nanobubbles uh, degassed. Uh, so we confirm that uh, our experiment confirms that uh, uh, CO2 nanobubbles is playing a very important role in shaping the surface morphology of the membrane. Now, uh, having understand that kind of mechanism, then we can do something further. For example, we can try to understand how does the pH of the uh, amine solution affects the, the surface morphology of our membranes. So here we, we performed our, our interfacial polymerization of the polyamide membrane over a range of uh, pH values uh, from pH 4 to pH 12.5. Uh, uh, and uh, we can see that at a uh, low pH, uh, the surface roughness is quite, quite mild compared to uh, pH uh, 6.3. By the way, pH 6.3 is quite special because that is the first acidity constant for carbonate uh, chemistry, uh, for carbonic acid. And the second pKa for carbonic acid is 10.3. We can see that uh, once our pH is around or above the first pKa, uh, then uh, the uh, solubility of uh, uh, solubility of uh, uh, CO2 in the aqueous solution will increase uh, exponentially. And uh, under that kind of condition, we can effectively develop uh, membrane surface roughness. And with uh, enhanced membrane surface roughness, we can see that uh, the water permeance of the membrane uh, increase steadily at, uh, when we increase the pH. While at the same time, actually the rejection of the membrane, both in terms of uh, NaCl rejection and the boron rejection, they both uh, enhances up to pH 10.3. So basically this kind of control of the surface morphology is very useful to simultaneously produce uh, membranes with simultaneously enhanced water permeance and selectivity. Now, uh, having understand this kind of a mechanism, we can go one step further. We can add some precursors which can, which, uh, uh, which will tend to release CO2 uh, nanobubbles. For example, uh, one simple thing to, to add is sodium bicarbonate. So we can add uh, different amounts of sodium bicarbonate into our amine, into our aqueous solution. And uh, with the addition of uh, this uh, CO2 precursor, it's going, to uh, it's going to react with the acids, uh, the byproducts from the interfacial polymerization, and uh, that will enhance the nanoforming condition, enhance the release of CO2 nanobubbles. So, uh, when you increase uh, the amount of uh, precursor loading, you get a fairly different morphology. And the nice thing is that uh, uh, when we are improving this, uh, we are change, tailoring this morphology, we can, in this particular example, we can double the water permeance. And at the same time, we also enhance the sodium chloride rejection of the membrane. Now, not only CO2, some other uh, gas or vapor components can also contribute to the development of the, uh, the development of the surface roughness. For example, the organic phase, uh, usually we use um, uh, organic solutions such as hexane, cyclohexane. Uh, these uh, solvents can be volatile. Now, uh, there's one study by, uh, led by uh, Guy Raymond's group. They investigated the temperature, the interfacial temperature at this reaction interface. And they have reported that the interfacial temperature can be as high as 90 degrees Celsius. 90 degrees Celsius because uh, the exomic nature of the interfacial polymerization. Now, uh, 90 degrees Celsius, actually this temperature is pretty high. It could be higher than many of the organic solvents we use for interfacial polymerization. Now, under that kind of condition, 
then one question is whether the organic phase could be vaporized to produce organic vapor. And that organic vapor can also contribute to the development of those kind of nanovoids in the polyamide structure. Now the answer is yes. We studied a series of uh, or, uh, organic solvents uh, from pentane, so basically uh, five carbon, uh, 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 six carbon, seven carbon, and uh, eight carbon chain. Um, uh, in this case, uh, when we increase when we increase the number of carbons uh, in the uh, in the um, um, solvent, uh, so basically the uh, the uh, vapor pressure will get uh, uh, the vapor pressure uh, will decrease or the boiling point will increase. Now, accordingly, here we can see that uh, uh, the membrane prepared using octane as a solvent. So basically, it has a lower vapor pressure. Uh, it has uh, somehow less extensive nanovoids compared to the membrane prepared with. Uh, with an organic solvent uh, of uh, pentane. So pentane, five carbon uh, uh, solvent, uh, it has a much higher vapor pressure or much lower boiling point. So during the interfacial heating, uh, pentane can be more easily vaporized to produce this kind of a larger nanovoids. And accordingly, if you look at the water permeance, the membrane prepared in pentane, has a much higher water permeance compared to that prepared in octane. Now, um, so both interfacial degassing and interfacial vaporization can contribute to the development of surface morphology, surface roughness. But uh, those uh, interfacial degassing or vaporization themselves are not enough because once gas or vapor are produced, you need somehow you need to retain those gas bubbles or vapor bubbles. So here, let's compare two uh, uh, reaction conditions. So uh, this is our control. So we perform interfacial polymerization on a polar substrate. Uh, you can see this kind of conventional type of ridge and valley roughness structure. Now, if we prepare a membrane at a free interface, so without the polar support, we only have the uh, organic phase and the aqueous phase. We form the membrane, actually this uh, polyamide film is much smoother, much smoother because uh, even if the bubbles are formed, there's no, uh, nothing to retain those bubbles in place. So they can freely move away from the reaction interface resulting in a much smoother membrane surface. Now, this uh, become more apparent when we start to try our interfacial polymerization on different types of substrates. So for example, if we perform our uh, IP reaction, interfacial polymerization on this kind of a uh, check edged cylindrical pores, we can see that uh, right above the pore area, right above the pore region, this uh, roughness is not developed. So, uh, surface roughness will only be developed away from this pore region. So in a, uh, over substrate areas somewhere like this kind of region, can, you, can develop, uh, you can develop surface roughness, but certainly not right above this pore because the retention, the ability to retain those gas bubbles is the weakest right above the pores. And here we can also see the backside of the polyamide film. This corresponds to the pore region. Now, if you perform a, interfacial polymerization on some other type of uh, substrate, for example, uh, nanofiber-based substrates. Here you can see that uh, the, the roughness will only develop right above the fibers where you get some gas retention by the fib fibers. But for those space between the fibers, this empty space between the fibers, you get a smooth, you get a fairly smooth polyamide film. So that's a further validation of the uh, nanoforming uh, uh, theory. Now, I know uh, my time is uh, quite limited, so I should uh, quickly run through uh, the other uh, topic, uh, TFNI membranes. Uh, these kind of membranes are, uh, has a special features. They have a 
an additional interlayer between the polyamide layer and the polar substrate. And uh, a, a recent review shows that compared to other type of uh, nano composite membranes, this uh, TFNR membrane stand out in terms of uh, enhancing water permeance. Uh, it has a potential to enhance water permeance of a membrane by almost an order magnitude. And the trick is that if you look at the, the water transport in those conventional uh, uh, RO membranes, TFC membranes, you realize that uh, because of the limited porosity of the substrate, so water, water molecules enters uh, at this uh, location, uh, they have to pass through the polyamide film in a non-strict manner. And this uh, effective pass length it could be uh, 10 times uh, longer than the, the actual thickness of the film. So this makes this kind of water transport very inefficient. But if you include a porous or a, a much more permeable interlayer, this can serve as a gutter. So water molecules can pass through the polyamide layer in the normal direction, and then they, tra uh, they transport in the transverse direction in the interlayer. In this kind of a combination, you can minimize the overall transport resistance. So uh, if uh, for a substrate porosity somewhere around 10%, which is very typical for commercial IO membranes, the uh, real available for this kind of structure, TFC uh, structure, the real available water permeance could be an order of magnitude lower than the ideal uh, case because of the uh, increased uh, transport lens. Now there, there's uh, many uh, additional uh, uh, advantages. In addition to the gutter layer effect, uh, if you compare traditional TFN approach and the TFNI approach, there's uh, uh, a lot of other benefits. For example, you can load your nanomaterials much more uniformly at high loading, and you can also produce thinner polyamide layers. Uh, because all this kind of advantage is combined. So here, let me show you some uh, experimental results. The control membrane without doing anything, so the uh, conventional TFC membrane, uh, pretty low water permeance, but with an interlayer included, you see there is almost like a, a six, seven times enhancement in water permeance. At the same time, the uh, selectivity of the membrane is also enhanced. And uh, another example here, we use a different material, poly, polydopamine as a, a interlayer. You can use many different uh, materials, for example, carbon nanotubes, uh, ferric acid uh, complex, uh, uh, but uh, the results are quite similar. You can achieve nearly an order of magnitude enhancement in water permeance and uh, uh, at the same time enhance the membrane selectivity. So here I construct an upper bound plot again, and all these points are interlayered nanocomposite membranes. You can see they clearly overperform the other conventional type of membranes. Uh, because of the uh, time constraints, so I'm not going to go through all this kind of detailed uh, mechanistic uh, explanation. If you are interested in the mechanisms, uh, I draw you all to this uh, critical review published last year. Uh, now, indeed, so putting an interlayer, in addition to the gutter layer effect, uh, putting the interlayer will also change the, uh, affects the growth of the polyamide morphology. So because uh, by introducing an uh, additional interlayer, it uh, improves the retention of those uh, interfacially degassed uh, bubbles. So uh, in this case, you can actually develop more nano voids inside the polyamide layer. So we say that actually there's two effects. The interlayer can uh, induce the gutter layer effect to improve the water transport through the polyamide layer. But in addition, the interlayer can also make this uh, polyamide uh, film itself uh, more permeable. These two uh, effects combined, they make the membrane uh, uh, very permeable. And uh, our analysis shows that uh, the 
the guts layer effect actually is a dominant effect. So here we show that by the gut layer effect itself, you get this kind of enhancement. And with the morphology change, you have some additional benefits to move from this level to this level. So uh, I have uh, very quickly gone through this kind of uh, the discussion of the upper bound and how we can, uh, we can uh, overcome the upper bound. Uh, now I know uh, time is uh, running out, so I'll stop my presentation here. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, uh, Dr. Jindi, are you there? Yeah, Dr. Jindi, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, th thank you, uh, Professor Tang, for your uh, insightful talk. And it was very uh, heartening to learn that talk, very useful. Uh, I think it's time for questions. So we will uh, take a few questions. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Nadim, please go ahead with your question. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tang, for a very nice and informative presentation. It is really interesting, and some of the concepts that we have seen is very new, and I'm um, hopefully that most of the students are joining us. They are really that uh, that will give the, give them the idea to work on it. Actually, uh, I have a very few simple questions about this. That uh, you have discussed about the interlayer, and. Uh, like there are a range of materials actually, like there is organic material, there are nanomaterial in which there is a 0, 1D, 2D, and even the 3D, and there, there are the nanocomposites. So what is the basic criteria select as a material as an interlayer? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, indeed, uh, in our review paper, we have uh, analyzed different type of materials, for example, 1D, 2D, um, um, or a, a simple interfacial coating. Um, somehow uh, there are some differences. Uh, for example, 1D material and uh, interfacial coating tend to have better enhancement effects for the water permeance. On the other hand, if you are talking about the selectivity, interfacial coating and the 2D porous material, such as uh, 2D uh, cough, uh, covalent uh, organic uh, okay, works. Uh, those works better. Uh, so uh, we are we are still trying to understand why, and uh, at the moment we are doing some simulation uh, simulation works. Uh, so it seems that um, some, somehow we, uh, for example, if you talk about uh, the uh, to enhance the selectivity by the interlayer then we want to have the uh, water to pass through the interlayer in a strict manner, uh, but uh, we want the uh, solute to pass through the interlayer through a zigzag kind of uh, uh, pathway. So that kind of strategy can enhance, uh, further enhance the selectivity of the material, uh, selectivity of the membrane. Mm -hmm. There is another thing that uh, I also was observing about that. No, uh, uh, some people that they are also using like a sacrificial interlayer. Ah, so, yes. Yeah. So what you think that uh, mean it is uh, good and uh, we can remove this interlayer without any any generating defects on the surface. Well, I mean, uh, in lab scale studies, uh, the sacrificial uh, approach works quite well. Um, so 
for example, the uh, one of the earliest studies uh, reported was uh, cadmium hydroxide uh, uh, nanostrands uh, by uh, reported by Professor Andrew Livingston's group. And uh, um, the, based on their study, uh, it was very effective in enhancing water permeance uh, through that approach, uh, the sacrificial approach. Now, uh, if you start to talk about the full scale production, then uh, it could be a bit more challenging. Um, so if, uh, if you over remove, uh, I mean, one, one potential concern is that uh, once you remove those uh, uh, sacrificial material, it could create some new defects, new pinholes in the uh, rejection layer, uh, which I don't know. I mean, uh, this has to be tested out uh, in full scale production. Uh, but I feel, uh, I mean, uh, if we talk about uh, real production, then we want uh, as few steps as possible. So uh, the additional post-treatment, post-washing or acid action uh, may not be uh, so good in terms of full-scale production. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I have only one last question, uh, Dr. Sam, if you allow me. Um, we are running out of time and I have a question. Uh, as well, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Tang for his presentation. I had a technical problem. Uh, I couldn't uh, speak. My uh, quick question, people are using um, sometimes uh, acid scavengers while they're fabricating their uh, polyamide. Uh, on the contrary, you are using um, some uh, gas uh, inducers, let me uh, call them. How do you address this? Well, I mean, uh, it's quite common uh, uh, people use uh, acid uh, scavengers. Uh, indeed, uh, if you note, uh, when we put in this, um, this uh, bicarbonate, in one of the paper, we reported the use of uh, sodium bicarbonate uh, to enhance the surface morphology. Uh, indeed, uh, that bicarbonate is also an acid scavenger. And uh, the reason that uh, by adding this uh, uh, bicarbonate, the uh, membrane rejection in, improves. It's because the cross-linking by, uh, by remove uh, the by, byproducts H plus. So the cross-linking of the polyamides can increase. So uh, it's, uh, it's actually very important to remove uh, H plus from the reaction. Now, the difference is that um, uh, in uh, typical uh, Conventional approach, uh, people generally use something like uh, TEA, uh, triacylamine, uh, which can accept a proton, but uh, this kind of uh, reaction does not produce uh, gas or vapor. Uh, while if we, we introduce something which can uh, also simultaneously reduce, uh, produce gas, then we can make uh, larger uh, nanovoids. Uh, which will increase the uh, fil available filtration area. Okay. All right. Well said. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, excellent presentation and inform informative presentation. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Mr. Uh, uh, Victor uh, Quantinella. Um, Victor works as a water lease specialist in uh, Grandfoss, a world leading uh, pump and water treatment uh, equipment company with 20 years of uh, experience in water treatment throughout uh, consultancy, construction and research and development. He has uh, 30 plus journal publications for patents, one book and one book chapter. Victor has been driving water technology at different uh, stakeholders, uh, his uh, simulations and data analysis. Uh, his main interests are water reuse and desalination, process automation, computer control simulation, and data analysis. He holds MSc in municipal water from UNESCO IHE, Institute of Water Education, and a PhD in advanced water treatment from Delft University. Um, of technology, both in the Netherlands, Victor sees himself as a water professional 
finding the balance between science uh, innovation versus engineering to allow the transition of the water sector from traditional school of the 90s and 80s into the 10 and 20s of the new millennium. Uh, Dr. Victor, please, the uh, mic is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ethan, for the nice introduction. Uh, I hope you can hear me, everyone. So let's uh, start yes. with the presentation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, 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 I'm, I've divided my presentation in these uh, two parts. The first part of this presentation is about the general progress of uh, control technology. It is an overview, but also uh, uh, looking into the future. That's why it's described a description of the present in some of the cases, many cases actually, what is shaping the future. And uh, we don't know about the future, but we can actually foresee what is coming in the near future. The second part is a more specific example uh, where I will be talking about a smart filtration suite that is uh, used for uh, controlling uh, membrane systems. <clears throat> so what is the present? And uh, talking about the present, I think it's necessary to find what is the time span of the present because right now we are 21 and uh, this is span of 20 years growing from the beginning of this millennium to the end of the first decade is actually meant by present because uh, it has been defining what we have now. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with this uh, 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 overview of, of SCADA. Uh, yeah, in a typical utility location. Uh, let's start at the bottom where uh, basically uh, we have sensors and uh, we have actuators, we, can, we have the valves and we have the pumps. Uh, this is the zero level. But in the zero level, we can also have already subsystems because a, a utility is composed of, uh, of, of, of uh, pumps with pressure boosters, uh, heaters, cooling systems, uh, even uh, nanofiltration arrow systems. So it, it starts to be complex because uh, what in principle, what you have to uh, look is into communicating from level zero to level one. And in level one, uh, what we have is basically uh, the uh, RTUs and the PLCs that will allow this communication. The RTUs, they are remote terminal units. The PLCs, those are programmable logic controllers, all at, all at level one. And uh, when we go one step up into level two, then we have a no horizontal integration. And the SCADA system is actually allowing the user to supervise and monitor the premise. And uh, uh, the question is, how the elements of the SCADA control communicate or how communication between the SCADAs or PLCs can happen. Uh, because you can see that at th this is an upper level a vertical integration, but uh, uh, the communication actually starting at horizontal integration is started here with a blue line. The answer, how they do communicate is field bus. And uh, what is field bus? Field bus is a general term, not a standard. Uh, many of these uh, uh, automation companies like Siemens, Schneider, uh, ABB, and you name it, they have developed their own field bus uh, solutions or communication protocols. Back of a uh, German company, they also have uh, the possibility to support different field bus protocols. And it's the same with the rest. More and more are coming. And the big automation companies actually have developed a, a way to standardize. And standardization has been a problem. So in Europe, there has been some kind of a standardization. Uh, what they work is the field bus specification. Uh, and uh, uh, with this, actually, there is place for standard. But, but it is complicated because there are also other companies coming with their own. There are uh, the companies uh, from Japan, from the States, also doing automation. And it is actually a challenge. But uh, uh, the way how they will communicate when they have different protocols is that they will use this uh, a gateway. And the gateway will allow actually communication between all the different uh, Profibus protocols that have been developed by different companies, but also it will be a way to communicate to 
uh, uh, other uh, uh, more standard becoming a standard communication, which is uh, defined in the cloud. So why the customer benefits when uh, these communication solutions are in place? Uh, first of all, as I have described, Philbus and uh, SCADA, they are already part of the systems, but not so many systems are in, in this uh, uh, level of uh, automation. Uh, the, the customer will actually benefit when this type of technology gives them a functionality, uh, not only to OEMs and to system integrators, but also to the end users. And uh, the benefit will come when uh, energy can be saved, uh, uh, consumables can be saved, and the comfort of uh, monitoring more systems and uh, using uh, time in other tasks uh, will be a benefit for both uh, OEMs and end users. But in order to do this, you need certain functionality that is coming from the communication itself. So how this data logging is being handled, how the control and operation uh, protocols are in place. So uh, Grunfos made a, a survey in 2017 about uh, uh, what is the uh, state of the industry uh, regarding connectivity and intelligent solutions. First of all, the findings revealed that 83% uh, of the interviewers believe that connectivity will play an important role in the future. 69% were ready to work with intelligent connectivity. And this is uh, this uh, 69, almost 70% is, is a high number because this uh, uh, interview was the, based on, on, on industry, uh, engineers, industry players. And 30%, uh, they thought that it was too challenging to work with intelligent connectivity because of uh, safety and security and so on. But uh, the benefits, most of them agree on the, that the benefits of this connectivity will be simplicity, flexibility. Now, what are the requirements to have this communication in place? Of course, pumps where uh, Grunfos is a world leader uh, are part of the, uh, of the system. And those are basically used for transporting and pressurizing water. But the other part that is important is what to look into the, into the operation, what, param what parameters to look into the operation. There are basic parameters that are well-defined when we are talking about filtration system for desalination, what we use, uh, uh, pressure, for example, uh, conductivity, uh, temperature, they are most of the time in place, but they are not distributed along the whole uh, process line. Uh, many times uh, uh, the OEMs and uh, end users, they try to simplify the costs and they kind of prioritize or eliminate uh, the presence of uh, the presence of sensors without knowing that the value coming of this uh, uh, reading of this data is actually huge. Uh, pH sensors, for example, are, are not quite a standard in in, in uh, filtration systems. Uh, they are not looking into the water quality, and, and and same for conductivity. They only focus on the conductivity on the permit, and they don't focus on the conductivity on the feed, for example. Some they do, some they don't do. Now, uh, what we uh, uh, offer or as I, uh, recommend most of the time in order to have this, not only uh, uh, the SCADA in place, but also the connectivity and the control part of it, is that uh, most of the, uh, these sensors, they should be installed on the systems. So uh, flow sensors, for example, there are different versions of flow sensors. Uh, this flow sensor is, a board, is using a vortex principle which actually uh, is uh, uh, convenient, uh, even at low flows. Uh, pressure, you have the uh, uh, relative pressure. You can also have uh, directly uh, differential pressure readings uh, in another version. And uh, the pressure can be also uh, uh, combined with a temperature sensor. Why you need two different sensors, one for pressure and one for temperature when you can basically do both at the same time. This will easy also communication. So instead of having 
to handle two uh, communication from two sensors, you can from one extract information about, uh, uh, about two parameters. And the same for the, for, for the flow. You can also get the flow and the temperature at the same time. Now, the future. The future is, of course, a little bit like depending on what has been done in this decade from the 10 to the 20s. We are starting basically the 20s, uh, 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 and, and it's not definitely there, but uh, it, it will come. Let me uh, bring a little bit of uh, time back to 2015 when uh, GE still was, GE Water, was still part of uh, an independent company uh, of, of GE, uh, not, not part of Swiss. But in 2015, what they claimed was that they were introducing this inside analytics. Uh, and it was especially targeting a uh, reverse osmosis system. You can see from the from 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 the graph that is it is a, a, a first person where, where you look in in a dashboard at uh, some measurements of uh, parameter it could be pressure it could be flow in this case uh, uh, it's not it's, it's not defined there but uh, this has been like cooking at that time in the 2015. What Swiss has done is actually have they have adopted uh, this uh, uh, GE development let's say into their our insight solution, which is basically uh, just a change and on the look uh, uh, because now it offers a connectivity to the cloud. And they are not the only ones. If we take Veolia, for example, uh, Veolia, they also have uh, uh, Aquavista. Previously, it was called Aquavista. And uh, now they have updated this to a hub for it. But again, uh, these big players, if we name only these two players, uh, they are they are they are going to uh, uh, upgrade this to a to a dashboard, but that is actually becoming a standard as well. So now, starting the twenties or even two years ago, more and more companies have started actually creating these dashboard standards. Uh, one example: Waterloo, a Belgian company. Uh, uh, H2O Innovation, uh, Canadian company. Uh, so more and more, especially with a crisis like, like, like COVID, the need for monitoring system remotely has uh, 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 increased exponentially. There are also others uh, uh, like Nalco that is selling the, the chemicals. They have been using this 3D, tra 3D tracer technology for membranes. Uh, they are already in the market probably 10 years. But what is coming next? Uh, what is it uh, that uh, when we have dashboards, SCADAS is kind of, uh, we can say the past, but it's still they are relevant because is many of these uh, uh, water utilities and uh, in industrial companies are heavily relying on SCADAS still uh, right now. Uh, I think the answer to what is the, the, the future, starting to be the future, is industrial IoT. And, and what is industrial IoT, the Internet of Things? You probably have heard of this term many times, but where are we? Uh, and, and, and the graph in the, in the left is actually describing where are we uh, uh, or how this is progressing, let's say. So I presented this SCADA part. And you can imagine this part of the SCADA and, and the sensors and the controllers where the data is originating uh, down in the bottom. Uh, and that is defined as an edge layer. So these industrial PSCs, embedded systems, gateways, all is happening at source, even some uh, uh, data visualization in the SCADAs, that is also in the edge layer. So it's the application on premises. That's what was defined uh, as an edge layer. They can also have like an internal local network where a, 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 a water utility, for example, is having different uh, uh, SCADAs. And apart from the communication, they also have security in place. So they will have a local network where firewalls and some data analysis will be taking place and also the visualization and the standardization start to be at this for clear. So this is, this is down. When the data start flowing to uh, the cloud, to the cloud layer, 
then we have uh, 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 IoT already in place. And in IoT, uh, 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 there are different providers. You have Amazon, you have uh, Azure, uh, uh, and many others uh, offering this possibility of uh, uh, the uh, layer in the cloud. Now, in the past, we focused quite a lot, now in the right, uh, in the past, we focused quite a lot on premises and some secondary sites is still on premises. In the future, everything is going to be interconnected. So, and, uh, and, and the way to, to interconnect things, that is the internet, of course, where you will have on premises, some of the edge things, a local network, uh, and, and the cloud connectivity. All, all in all, uh, will define how these uh, tools that are coming uh, for going beyond monitoring, like SCADA, uh, will be also going into troubleshooting, into reporting tools, and so on. As I have mentioned it before, you have a gateway. You have had some kind of, 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 of SCADA and different communication protocols at this level. Now you need also a gateway to know how to talk, how to uh, create the interface to the cloud, to the, to the internet. And uh, uh, once you start having quite a lot, quite a lot of data, let's say, then, then crunching this data, processing this data becomes to be a challenge. You have XX, a number of sensors and transmitters, and you have also water quality parameters all in all. Now you really need to be an expert to start uh, 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 making expert systems controls uh, for targeting special systems. Uh, but when you have such a volume of data, what you probably will need is going to be a digital service uh, or, or water as a service, someone is, that is taking care of your, of, of your systems. Who is driving the market? It's, as I have mentioned it, uh, uh, the remote monitoring, uh, uh, the digitalization is also accelerating this, and also uh, having a green profile because uh, uh, all of these tools will, at the end of the day, allows you uh, um, some savings in operational costs. So uh, Smart Filtration Suite is an example of uh, uh, technology uh, that is using dynamic execution of signals for cleaner, better, and cheaper membrane filtration systems. Uh, I will come back to this cleaner, better, and uh, uh, less expensive. So the membrane systems, they uh, have been running, but uh, uh, the way they have been running is actually uh, the set points, uh, constant set points, where in some cases they have become ineffective and uh, leading to excessive operational costs. So uh, the main fear is uh, scaling, organic fouling, uh, and then uh, uh, downtime of, of, of the system or expensive SIPs, uh, prolonged SIPs. So chemical dosing, it is good. You need some kind of treatment. This is an oversimplified uh, 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 membrane system overview. Uh, chemical dosing, that's the pretreatment. Sometimes you will be uh, uh, overdosing and sometimes underdosing. Flashing and backwashing. Flashing especially is important for nanofiltration and RO and backwash that is uh, mainly using MF and uh, UF uh, hollow fiber membranes. And of course, you also want to look into uh, what, is the, uh, what is the necessary time of when to sip and how much to sip as well. So the Grunfos approach to work with real time and uh, uh, data that is coming as it, uh, as it is uh, uh, got in the edge. So basically uh, uh, the uh, smart filtration suite is, 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 is a PLC, uh, slate PLC in the site on the premise communicating with the master PLC. And this is very important because the master PLC it's having control of the system, no matter what. The, the slave control that is in another PLC is just taking set points and is reacting to this. So for example, they're saying uh, how much uh, uh, the pump should be running a flashing cycle or how much the dosing patch should be dosing of certain chemical. So we have uh, in this uh, graph, 
the way how uh, this is uh, structured. Uh, on the right, you have like an expert system control algorithm where you really need the operator now how to come up with an advanced control algorithm. But you also need some elements of the left because you need the bump know how, uh, how you should be setting up or stepping up uh, this dosing bump, for example, or how you will be uh, uh, increasing the pressure uh, in a good way not to uh, not to alter the, the complete system uh, operation. Or what about if you are running at uh, constant permeable flow and uh, not at constant pressure? So. And of course, the standard sensors, because those sensors are giving you the response of the system directly. If the water quality is changing, then the response of the system is also changing. Uh, and, and you need uh, uh, the sensors uh, for this sake. Now, the machine learning part, uh, which is in the middle, you can basically have some operations of of uh, 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 the flashing or the backwashing, for example. How long do you actually need to, to flash? Uh, is it uh, uh, five minutes? Is it, is it uh, 10 minutes? Why not uh, uh, four or seven, something like that? Uh, when you are uh, uh, reporting, uh, making a prediction over a month of data, so when in the coming months you will be expecting the SIP, that's why uh, prediction with machine learning is just. Now, what is monitoring in uh, an NF and RO system? Uh, most of the, of, of, of the uh, operators, they use uh, differential pressure. Uh, some of them, they are having some kind of data normalization where they uh, have the normalized permit flow. Uh, but, but, but flow is, is, is a sensor that is not that much precise. Pressure is, is having better responses, much more precise than uh, than flow and and pressure that gives you a direct picture of uh, how the membrane looks like uh, uh, your feed pressure will increase because your membrane is getting to fall but how to get rid of the variations of the water quality uh, temperature conductivity even ph and that's why uh, you need to you need to normalize or you need uh, uh, to use this net driving pressure uh, which has been the standard but in this case, we, we, we also correct this uh, net driving pressure with temperature. So in that way, you can account for, for, for uh, different uh, types of scaling and depending also on where are you monitoring this net driving pressure? Are you monitoring that on the front? Are you monitoring that on the, as a system as a whole? Or are you monitoring that uh, uh, net driving pressure in the last stage where scaling is happening? You can be monitoring actually both. You can be monitoring the front and the end and then having a response of how organic fouling develops and when inorganic fouling starts taking place. So to, uh, to apply this uh, smart filtration suite in non-filtration and uh, narrow systems, you need some uh, user inputs, the recommended dose of, 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 the, of, of the chemical provider. This is agnostic to, to, to the chemical provider because you don't know uh, what is it on the recipe of, of, of this chemical that is used for, for, for pre-treatment uh, and anti-scalant, for example. Uh, most of these uh, control algorithms, they are optimized on, on cost. So the idea is to minimize the cost of production. And in that case, you need, of course, prices of energy and chemical. And also the boundary conditions of the membrane manufacturer, because the membrane manufacturers, they will specify certain boundary conditions for the operation of this system, of, of the membrane itself. And uh, 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 the, the, the rest, the continuous system input that is coming from the sensors, uh, data normalization, and uh, uh, once uh, uh, the data is being processed, then the output of this smart filtration suite will be execution signals. If we look into the example of anti-scale and dosing in non-filtration and narrow, the standard has been a, a, a constant dose in a constant line. That has been the traditional approach. Uh, but this traditional approach could have ended up in overdosing and sometimes in underdosing. Now the actual dosing needs are actually uh, dynamic. 
dynamic because it's responding to how uh, the water uh, quality look like in January coming from uh, borehole A. And uh, uh, all of a sudden the next week, uh, borehole A has some problems and they switch to borehole B or C. Uh, and the same uh, uh, case can be said if there is surface water where they start taking water from a river, but it's not no longer from the river, but it's coming from a lake or a, a, a treated effluent from a wastewater treatment plant. So variation. In, in reality, you, you kind of expect that uh, even uh, groundwater will be stable in quality, uh, but it's not the case. Even if it's a uh, provision of, uh, of, uh, of a very stable water quality, you still can uh, benefit from the responses of, 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 of this variation, because uh, as I have mentioned it overdosing, uh, then, then the water is not the problem, but this overdosing of chemical, when you have a very constant water can be a problem. So for example, here, uh, what we have, as I have mentioned it, uh, uh, the, the delta P, the differential pressure, where uh, 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 an, an operator uh, has been relying on this uh, differential pressure for, for, for saying now it's time to, to do uh, uh, an action, uh, for example, a flashing or a sip. But delta P is very limited uh, compared to uh, uh, net driving pressure, for example. You can see here uh, in blue the, the delta P, 70% recovery, 83% 80, uh, recovery. And uh, you have almost a constant line uh, for DP. There has not been uh, a change in here. When you start looking into net driving pressure, corrected for temperature, uh, 70 and 80, even at 80, you see a small uh, uh, increase and 83% is very clear. Uh, that uh, scaling has been identified uh, in this case and not uh, by delta P. When you do this uh, uh, optimization, uh, so what is actually what you get uh, as uh, overall uh, numbers? So uh, in this particular example, what you get is 7% uh, reduction of energy consumption, 68% reduction of chemical consumption, uh, this uh, uh, data is uh, just a benchmarking in, in, in seven days, very short, but the data is, is consistent as well when you take into uh, uh, consideration a longer data, a year or a, a, a months of data. Now, I'm showing this slide, just uh, I will uh, skip this slide, but um, uh, one important thing in NF and RO is the pretreatment. And many cases of uh, uh, seawater desalination and, and, and what we use are uh, uh, having a spur treatment, uh, microfiltration or ultrafiltration, uh, or even nanofiltration, depending. But uh, uh, this uh, anion layer, what is shown here, it's uh, uh, the part that is targeting uh, MF and UF. Uh, you can have a, a net flow manager, you can have an adaptive cycle of uh, filtration uh, and, and backwash and then you can have an adaptive quackage. So why uh, this, is, this is a traditional uh, filtration process where you have fixed it, that you should be doing backwash every um, certain time. Uh, so this blue backwash and a very uh, uh, fixed amount of time, uh, two minutes of backwash every three hours, for example, and then a sip every week and so on. But why are not you responding to actually the water quality? Here, the water quality was okay, so your backwash, and it was short, as you can see from the red, uh, uh, very short. Also here, uh, backwash, short. You can see the time of when to backwash is different. Here you have a spike of water quality that actually says, now you need to backwash, and you need to backwash me more because I'm, uh, uh, I have more falling because of that, and then you backwash a little bit more, and so on. Just with this philosophy of, uh, of uh, backwashing a bit more frequent and on different uh, time scales, because you can see this red plus red plus red will be actually higher on, on the water that you have spent on all this uh, 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 number of five backwash compared to two backwash. But then you actually need a sip, not in a week, but probably in a month or in two months. Uh, this same principle can be used for flashing. Uh, nanofiltration and an arrow, exactly the same principle uh, of, of defining 
when to do the flashing and how long to do the flashing. And this is presented here. Uh, you could see that uh, in this uh, example, uh, uh, flashing was not even implemented um, uh, in the graph uh, in the left. Flashing was not even implemented in this uh, system. And they were having a, a DP of five bars, uh, differential pressure of five bars. And the system was starting to, 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 to fall as well on the, on the last stage. And the recovery was below 70. Uh, so, and they are doing the, they, uh, they were relying on, on many SIPs uh, actually to, to, uh, uh, to improve the system. Now, uh, when they changed to uh, uh, flashing, which uh, was optimized, then they reduced the delta P to 1.5 on average. The recovery was increased to more than 70%. And, 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 and the pressures because of this recovery also increased. And the SIPs were also reduced uh, quite significantly. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. please. Yeah, uh, I think I have two more slides and then I'm done. Uh, so what is it this when we put some value into full scale customer impl implementation? So we have a, a, a customer case one with a 1,500 cubic meters per day uh, water reuse system uh, in, in, in a factory where uh, the energy consumption was reduced by 20%. Uh, the chemical consumption by 60% and the membrane replacement just because of this uh, flashing and less SIP was actually improved and it was reduced by 17%. The other case, a uh, bigger uh, brackish water uh, desalination plant uh, where the energy consumption was reduced by seven and the chemical consumption by 68. The numbers uh, depending, uh, this customer case two is in India, so Indian prices, 11,000, uh, euros. The other one is in uh, Germany, uh, 20,000 uh, euros of savings. And that's where I come back to this cleaner, better and cheaper approach of uh, a small filtration suite. Uh, the monthly reports, of course, uh, uh, beyond the dashboard is not only many dashboards that you create for the operator, but it's the insights that you keep in the report, what is actually relevant for them. Because all of the sudden they can compare a report from month uh, uh, one to month five and see the difference. And those are uh, PDF reports uh, where they get to, to read uh, some recommendations and conclusions about their systems. Thank you. That was all from, uh, uh, from, uh, from Grunfoss uh, presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Quintanella. Uh, is there any questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Asif, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the informative and insightful talk. And really, it's I think it's an important aspect to look uh, to, to optimize the overall system. And the findings are very uh, beneficial in terms of savings. Uh, you gave uh, two reports. One was for uh, brackish water and the other for may, perhaps a waste treatment. Do you have some findings for seawater uh, reverse osmosis units also? Uh, has uh, this been? Uh, uh, no. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, seawater examples. And it will be really interesting to, to have a uh, a case story for uh, sea water. That brackish water that I have shown, it mm -hmm. was it had a salinity of around uh, three thousand, four thousand. Uh, we are looking actually into 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 options to have a sea water uh, desalination plant uh, uh, as as a case story, as I have mentioned. But but unfortunately, not until now. Uh, yeah, this is this is a very recent uh, uh, offer from Grunfos. Uh, uh, we, we we went commercial last year, so 2020. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Thank you, uh, Professor, for uh, the nice presentation. Actually, I have one question. Uh, comparing between SCADA system uh, and uh, Internet of Things, uh, 
uh, uh, SCADA system monitoring and controlling, uh, mainly is, uh, Internet of Things only monitoring sensors, uh, which, which one is optimum, taking in, in the account uh, that uh, the cost of SCADA system is higher than the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and uh, uh, that, that's, that's the problem that, that SCADA is it's fixed. So if, if you have had a, a, a subcontractor uh, or let's say a very specific example, the contractor has, uh, has, has put this uh, uh, system in place, but it has not been the contractor directly, but the subcontractor. And then the subcontractor will charge more for the hours that it's spending on, 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 on having the system running with some updates or upgrades, et cetera, et cetera. On the uh, Internet of Things, you basically uh, 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 have these big companies where the costs are much more cheaper, where the uh, computational of, of the, uh, that is required uh, for all these parameters uh, will, uh, will cost less. And also, uh, uh, when we have this local DLC uh, running in place, you, you, you basically don't need support for that box because what you are interested on is the signals and uh, and that has to be in place. So the SCADA is more expensive than, than IoT. Now the question is, how do you jump from the SCADA directly to, to IoT? Uh, then then you, you need a much more modern PLC. So the PLCs right now, uh, they are kind of uh, not ready to the to the IoT, but are coming. So, and and when I when I say are coming, that's that's probably from 2018, 19. You already could find uh, uh, SCADAs that can communicate directly to the cloud. Siemens is one example. Beckhoff is one example, and, and and many others. So they are coming also with products that are allowing this interface much more easily. Uh. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure uh, we have more questions, especially for the sensors. I know people are uh, very interested in sensors, but um, if there's any people um, who are having any question about uh, sensors or wants to learn more uh, from Victor, um, we can uh, get you in touch with them. Thank you very much, uh, Victor, for this nice presentation. Thank you, thank you. Uh, our next uh, speaker uh, is Dr. Uh, Martin Bishevel. Uh, Dr. Martin uh, holds a PhD degree in Chemical Engineering and Material Science, uh, University of Twanta 2000, and is now a senior scientist at uh, WETSIS, European Center of Excellence for Water Technology, the Netherlands. He is the co-author of a graduate textbook, Physics of Electrochemical Processes, he is author of around 150 scientific publications on chemical engineering, colloid science, and water desalination by electrodialysis, capacitively ionization, nanofiltration, and reverse osmosis. According to the 2020 Stanford Elsevier ranking, the citation impact of his work is worldwide in the top 0.1%. He is editorial board member of the Journal of Desalination and Journal of membrane science letters. On top of this, he has a forest near a river that I would like to visit one day. Welcome on board, Dr. Martin. Uh, thank you for being with us. Well, th thank you very much. Yes, well, it's my pleasure and honor to be an attendant and speaker again at this event uh, by the IRC for, for membranes and water security of the uh, King Fahd University. So thank you for this introduction i think actually this forest thing i told you last time i was a presenter you did not mention it then but now you did yes but that's, that's true indeed and uh, well we can talk about that later so indeed last time i talked about the battery deionization a very small technology but very very uh, new and today this symposium is about the ro uh, uh, a very big topic and and, and applied worldwide uh, and still a lot of science and research uh, uh, is to be done about that. And this beautiful symposium is, uh, is evidence of that. Uh, so indeed, it's not just about seawater. But in Europe, we also use it for groundwater or, or also to remove organic 
uh, contaminants from, from, from surface water, from rivers. But let's say for today, the focus is a bit more on seawater. Uh, I presume that's, that's good. So it's really my pleasure to talk about this. It's absolutely super new. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll tell you a bit more about that. Uh, it relates to a paper I submitted uh, Saturday together with colleagues. So let me share my screen now. So that's uh, this one. Share. So very good. And there's indeed the issue how to um, write video panel. This looks a little bit better. Well, let's continue uh, like this. It's indeed a disadvantage. You, I can't see you guys, and I can't see myself. So, so, <laughs> uh, but uh, but that's that's okay. We'll manage. So, uh, reverse osmosis. This kind of picture, all of you uh, will know. Uh, and today, I really uh, will only look at 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 behavior right at the membrane. Uh, feed water becomes concentrate or retentate, and and water will permeate to the permeate site site. Uh, the membrane, the very thin membrane, perhaps it's 100 nanometer thick or, or around that order. It is charged, there's charges inside and therefore there, there are counter and co-ions and I'll come to that topic in a moment. Uh, so this is the basic uh, layout and we'll be discussing that. So it's part of a paper, I'll be discussing a, a paper we submitted very recently to the Journal of Membrane Science Letters. I don't think they have or have yet um, uh, published uh, manuscripts, uh, but you can submit your paper. And uh, the corresponding author for this is uh, a name already mentioned uh, earlier today. I guess some of you know him, uh, Professor Elimelech from Yale University. So it's a collaboration of myself and colleagues in the Netherlands together with uh, Professor Elimelech. I have to uh, uh, solve this problem on the screen that uh, height floating meter cross. This looks better. Very good. So this presentation is about the solution diffusion model, why we should and why we can uh, correct it and why it's important. And that on a more technical level relates to uh, why a parameter called B, B in the SD model and in the parametrization of uh, theories based on the SD model is better replaced by a B double prime. It's not difficult and I'll explain you how and why it's important and why it's helpful. So I, I presume most of you know, if, if we look at tra transports of salts or solutes through a membrane, we have up front, we have uh, the, the, the concentration increase of solutes uh, towards the membrane, uh, the CP layer or CP for concentration polarization, or the diffusion boundary layer. That's not a word for it. Uh, concentrations can go up by 30% or 50%, dependent, of course, on how fast we push the water through the membrane. So the two things that we are interested in, well, there's more things, is how much water flows through the membrane. So the water flow rate per unit area and the solute flow rate. So this presentation will not consider all the complexities of, of, of seawater. Uh, we either discuss theories for, for neutral solutes, and what's the word solute? That's a molecule, a dissolved species in the water. Uh, so it's either for neutral or the simplest case of a salt, a 1-1 salt like sodium chloride. So this presentation and many of the experiments done to characterize membranes uh, is often indeed done with, uh, for instance, sodium chloride. So what do we do when we measure in the lab with a coupon or a small module uh, uh, data for RO? Well, we apply a pressure difference that we, we measure, we apply it. We measure how much water comes through the membrane. The, so the permeate water flux. So I use the symbol V for velocity of the water, but also this one, flux, volumetric flux of the water per unit area, how much water comes through the membrane, how much volume. On this permeate site, site we like to know the concentration of either this one solute or of the salt. So that's what we measure, CP. And we calculate a rejection or retention. If anybody can tell me which word is actually better, let me know. For, as far as I know now, they are completely equivalent. And it's 50-50. 
whether you use this one or that one. Uh, retention being one minus, you know this, the concentration at the permeate site divided by that at the feed site. Solute flux. So under certain conditions, for instance, when it's an experiment with a low water recovery, we know that if we know measure CP, and we measure the water flow rate, we, the product thereof is the solute flux through the membrane. Now, with all these data, we would like to make some sense of it. And why we do that, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in a moment, or we go through that in a moment. Water permeability, how much water comes through per, per bar pressure, and salt permeability, B. So typically, of course, A, we want to have as high as possible, and lots of water flow for uh, not a lot of pressure. And salt permeability must be low. We don't want leakage of salt. So what this is about, eh, at calculating A and B, measuring it, and then later comparing it, that, that I call parametrization. You parametrize, parametrize the, the behavior of a membrane. You summarize the, the behavior, the data in A and B. You need to do that in a good way. So, so why indeed would you want to do that? Derive, measure A and B values of your membrane. Well, then you can compare one membrane with another membrane. That would be good. And perhaps they end up having the same A, but one has a better, better meaning lower B than the other. Then you know which one you like better, at least on, in this regard. Uh, and that could also be in your experimental program. You make different uh, uh, syn synthetic uh, uh, variants of the same membrane, and then you can see which is better. Also different temperatures. It will be very dependent on temperature, on salt type. I mentioned sodium chloride, but other salt types, even within monovalent, monovalent salts, it will be different. So then you can compare. And you can also compare with, with what your colleagues did for the, perhaps the same membrane in a different lab. So they need to be intrinsic. It is A and B, or perhaps as you already might have noticed the B, I suggest a different uh, parameter. They need to be intrinsic. They need to be a number describing the leads for that temperature and that salt type, uh, something real about the membrane. Otherwise you can't compare. And if, you, if that's possible, then the equations that you use to parameterize, they are then okay, they are good. And then you can also use them to make simulations, uh, uh, theoretical studies about, for instance, cost engineering and how to optimize. And if they're not, if it turns out, for instance, the B is all over the place, even for the same membrane, then probably the theoretical model that you use to parametrize is also wrong. So these two things are, are often the same. This good parametrization to get the good numbers, good definition, A and B, is, is intimately linked to have a good process model that you can then use for, for simulations. So how to do that, how to go about that? I'll not discuss today how we include the CP layer. There are a few equations for that and they're pretty standard. And indeed, typically a concentration in the feed right at the membrane will be a concentration perhaps 30% higher or 50% dependent on the flow rate. So that can all be done. So because in the end we need this concentration, not in the feed, but at the membrane. I call that often interface. So that's the concentration you need on the upstream side. But that's pretty technical, not it's very easy and, and, and standard. So that's not in this presentation anymore. So we look at A, the, the water permeability, and the equation we use is, 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 is uh, well, it's not so difficult. You measure how much water comes through, the, the volumetric flux of water, you divide by the driving force. So the pressure you apply, minus Osmotic pressure difference across the membrane. So this is why you need this, this interfacial concentration on the upstream side, not the feed concentration, but the one right at the membrane. That gives you the osmotic pressure difference that in a way pushes back that you subtract from the pressure you apply, and then you can calculate A. And that's uh, and that's actually I have no uh, no contention with that. That's still uh, 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 the same as I would uh, suggest. So this is a nice example of uh, the pressure you apply for three uh, levels of the salt concentration. And the membrane used here is a, uh, now it's called a DuPont or Dow uh, SW30 membrane, so a commercial uh, good, very good uh, seawater reverse osmosis membrane. So we have the pressure in bars, we measure how much water comes through, 
in this kind of experiment at low uh, water recovery. And you see that this, this, this uh, model fits very nicely these data. So the parametrization uh, seems to be accurate. So indeed all these data, these, these lines, so the lines are theory and the, uh, the data points are data. Um, they, they fit nicely with one value of A and a typical value indeed uh, well known or typical for seawater are all membranes just below two LMH per bar and LMH, you know, is a liter per square meter per hour. So all these experiments are at low water recovery. Yeah, so that makes it a bit easier to analyze. So that's A. Now you may have guessed B is a different story because the idea is simple, pretty similar to, the, to what we did, just did for water. Now you take the solute flux or the salt flux and you divide again by the driving force, the concentration difference across the membrane, the, the interfacial concentration on the upstream side minus the permeate concentration. And this idea is based on the solution diffusion model. The idea that what water and, and solutes, salt yeah, diffuse uh, through the membrane, uh, not much interacting with one another, and the charge effects of, of salts are not, not, not considered. It's just that it dissolves with the partitioning on the upstream side, uh, solubility, and then it diffuses, and then there's another partitioning on the downstream side. And then indeed, the equation you then predict for, for solute flux would be a proportionality times concentration difference. And that proportionality would be the solubility. So indeed the distribution of the salt inside the membrane and in solution outside and a mobility. This could be a diffusion coefficient divided by thickness. So that's why uh, it's solution diffusion. And if that's true, then this would be a retention. One minus this, this constant over the, the water flow rate. And this is because of the uh, CP layer. So if the CP layer is not important, this, this disappears and you get this uh, equation. So retention in that, that simple case is one minus this constant over water flow rate. Now that's very interesting. It predicts that you can always, if there's no CP layer, if you increase water flow rate, you will always at some point reach 100% retention. That's a bit strange that irrespective of the properties of the membrane, so irrespective of, of, of whether there is even some solubility uh, different from one, you can always reach 100% ret retention. That, that is a bit strange. And you see it only depends on water flow rate. So how good does that work? And this is a bit illustration of that. So this SD model, it predicts that, as I already talked, discussed, and you all know this, uh, the water flow, you first need to, well, get beyond some, some value. And then indeed, ex every additional pressure leads to the water flow. And it says, well, the salt flux is pretty constant. Here, this picture does not consider the, the, the CP layer. If that would be true and, and in some other uh, uh, boundary condition applies, salt flux in the SD model is, is constant. So indeed, the higher the pressure at some point, you always reach 100% retention. Now that ID and this therefore the, the assumption that this is a good model may once have seemed reasonable when in the development membranes used to have perhaps only 50% retention and 70 and 90. And then with new, the, the new polyamide uh, thin film composite membranes, you would reach, well, what seemed like 100% or close to 100%. And then this kind of a model uh, seems very applicable. But now we are going to look more precisely at this last two or three percent, because 99 percent retention is different from 98 or 97, let alone 100. These differences become very, very important. So it is important what happens there right at the upper boundary of this uh, kind of curve. So does it work? So this is the equation I already gave. It predicts retention depends on the water flow rate. And so we have data, this membrane I mentioned. So this is how much water comes through the membrane. And this is the retention. And indeed, similar to a graph I just showed, it does go up with, uh, with, with water flow rate. And does this equation apply? Yeah, that works nicely. There's no problem there. However, this was just one salt concentration. It was a salt solution. And 
we did this experiment at three salt concentrations and not even that different. It's just a factor of three different. Uh, I mean, you can apply uh, the, 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 the membranes and have a thousand, a factor of thousands difference in feed salinity. So the data suggests, and that's very well known, that if the for salt solution, if you have lower concentration, the retention gets better. And with, with more salts towards seawater, then it gets worse. But the SD model does not predict that. It's really, there's one B, it's just a membrane parameter, and there's no effect of salt concentration. So in that regard, I would say this shows it's not right. It's not good enough. It can't describe salt, the behavior of, of, of uh, retention when you uh, separate salts from water. But let's say you nevertheless use the equation I, I showed before. Yeah, then what you find is that these B values you derive are all over the place. Even with this only factor of three difference in feed concentration, the, uh, then the, the values of B you derive from each, each individual experiment go from this value, almost 0.5 numerical value of B down to 0.2. So that's already a factor of two and a half. So there's no unique value of B. It's not, uh, it's not intrinsic. And you can't really compare how to compare now. Then you would have to have all the experimental conditions the same. And that's not what happens in literature. Salt concentration and feed and flow rates. So the comparison becomes more difficult, becomes more vague, more fussy. And this is a study by Freger. They have also lots of data. And then they, in a theory, derive B. So in a way, this is data points for B, the same B as from salt concentration. And now it's a factor 100 difference. And they uh, have, have, have dependent on the salt, they have up to a factor of 30 difference in B depends on salt concentration. So B is not unique, it's not intrinsic. And uh, the, the, the method to, to parameterize is wrong. It's not good, not for salts and good RO membranes. Then we get into the topic of this uh, selectivity, permeability trait of course that were mentioned uh, this morning and the open membrane database. Uh, the point I want to make right now is only this, that this database with these several hundreds of data points, and sometimes it's, it's uh, many data points from one paper, of the one on the same membrane at different uh, feed concentrations or, or, or pressures, then it's not that one point is one membrane. For instance, these, these, this here, it's, it's very far from the boundary, so it's perhaps not so important, but the point is the same, that this is one membrane, and, and, and the A may be roughly the same, but the, the, the B value, which is here, this is selectivity, it's A over B. This is a high, high number, that's a good membrane. Uh, well, there's, there's a, well, let's say, factor three difference. So, so not each point is not just intrinsic to a membrane, and perhaps that also has an impact here. But, but let me get to that later. So there's an alternative. There is another parametrization for membranes with salts. Mr. Sonin from MIT, uh, we take, and I only go through this theory very quickly. We take the Nernst Planck equation for the flow of ions, co ions, and counter ions. So the membrane is charged. So one type of ion is, is rejected, not just by volumetric effects, but also by charge from the membrane, and the other is, is attracted into the membrane. That's the counter ion. Uh, to compensate the charge of the membrane. So there's advection and diffusion and electromigration, and there's two ions and there's electroneutrality. And on the boundaries, we have Donan, which relates to Boltzmann, which is that a concentration just in the membrane is that just outside and a partitioning coefficient, which can have all kinds of uh, contributions. And then this electrostatic Donan effect that relates to the Donan potential and the valency, the charge of an ion. Now. We can all combine it, you get a nice equation, and we can then simplify the equation in the limit that the co-ion, the ion that is already rejected because of the charge, is indeed being rejected very well. And that's, 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 that's very likely for these uh, RO membranes. Then we simplify further by already assuming it's a good membrane, the CP, the permeate concentration is much lower than the feet, and we don't push too much. And that's also true in RO, the volumetric flow rate, as a number is less than the uh, mass transfer coefficient in the membrane. Then we get an equation that predicts a different kind of B, B prime. 
and you can now start to calculate that p prime again by the salt flux and this difference in the concentration in salt across the membrane that used to be a one but now the prediction is two very interesting and the equation that is related to that is retention has now this new b b prime feed concentration is linear in feed concentration and that is new so the higher the salt concentration the more it's reduced and this is new this was not in the sd model and this uh, cp layer effect is not a one here but a two and that also has an impact but this is more important the feed concentration is there and there's the expression for that it also has the partitioning coefficient and and mobility and the membrane charge and i'll get to that uh, also later so how does that work that's new parametrization so we again have the data for retention versus water flux the three data sets it's a bit expanded so you can see it better so we now do have a fit of this model with one value of b prime and indeed is now it's different and it has the right trends that that uh, low salinity water is has better retention and, and, and higher so that's good but it's not good enough now it actually overestimates the effect of salt flux so uh, you would like this red line to be higher a little and the green line closer so it now overestimates it's a lot better already but it's not good enough and then that's why we go to be double prime because the idea is and it's not my idea it's several times mentioned in literature the, the charge density of, of a membrane an ro membrane or perhaps an f membrane depends on salt concentration and indeed you need higher salt concentration to reach a high value of x it's positively correlated if, if you really remove the salt uh, then there's several uh, uh, reasons why that could be the case the the memory charge goes down and that's that's a model i made a long year donald model and i think it relates to ph and the donald potentials and it ends up with the fact that in my estimate the the fixed charge density of the membrane is uh, proportional to the, the concentration on the upstream side to a power n 0.4 so indeed you need so to have high x you also have higher that happens when the salt concentration is higher so that 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 modifies then this uh, term here now how does that work now the same data and now these this model with the same equation for this retention but just this fact that this memory in charge is a function of of uh, salt concentration now it fits data nicely so we're very happy about that so how now to do that so i now hopefully convince you this works and i think i, I i'm pretty confident that for all polyamide thin film composite membranes this this method should be valid and uh, the chemistry is always roughly the same so how to do that so now a little recipe to make it very clear how in the how when after experiments you go to the excel files and you do that so how to now arrive at this number so again you have a solute flux salt flux you divide by the difference in concentration upstream downstream squared and then this 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 stuff about this power so you multiply by uh, interfacial concentration and a reference that's just one millimolar just to make it dimensionless to this power point four so that's it so it's, it's the same experiment as before because there you also measured two concentrations and the cp uh, effect you could do so it's just that it's now it's two instead of one and and there's this extra term that's everything nothing else so very easy so it's not if difficult uh now it would be nice to do not just one experiment but do that at a few uh, salt concentrations and of course to do different pressures so different flow rates and all these experiments you can check it you can calculate the, the old b and i predict they're all over the place at least a factor of two or three difference between low and high values and i predict that for your membrane this will be much closer perhaps only 10 or 20 percent instead of a factor of three that would then uh, prove or give more evidence that this is a good idea if it's also a factor of three then apparently this this is not working but i'm confident it, it will but will but you can then check so to show that you can indeed now with this better model also make a full module calculation this is an example calculation for breakfast water and seawater 
right? So we make this now a calculation. So I now basically plug in those equations into uh, a module calculation, a two-dimensional module calculation, and we vary. Uh, it's it's a fixed uh, production per uh, area of 20 LMH, and have we vary water recovery and calculate well the required pressures and therefore the, the total costs of that system, the energy costs. Um, and for brackish water, we get that at, at the optimum, the least costs. Well, there's a pressure of around 18 bar, a few bars above the minimum, and the water recovery for this brackish water of 50 millimolar is around 80%. Well, that seems reasonable at this minimum. Indeed, when you compare to the seawater, where at the optimum, where the costs are minimum, perhaps it's 65 bars, but it's kind of a weak minimum, and the typical water recovery will be around 50%. And that's indeed uh, what uh, seawater RO systems typically operate at, uh, this range of perhaps 50 or 60 percent water recovery. So these calculations come out very realistically. So the, the open membrane database published next year, but it's already published, a very uh, paper that many people uh, read. So that presents uh, lots of data per membrane, not yet be double prime, but I, I can predict this will soon be added. So let's Let's take that data that, that, that you can just download. And now we plot this new parameter, this new selectivity, A over B double prime, because I think that's a better way to, to define selectivity, not the old B, but B double prime against uh, permeability. And these are all these 500 data points in that, or, or, or well, this is pretty much all of them. We did uh, one check. So you can see it's all over the place. And you could say, well, there's kind of upper boundary here. So this is. Uh, also, still the same. There's kind of upper boundary, and that's well. Let's see if we can still make that better. But it's interesting. If you now go and check all these papers, then then all of these for sure are are dubious. These are commercial. There's a website from the companies, and they just put a number, impossibly high numbers for. Retention 99.8% in seawater. There are patterns from 40 years old, or, or and some are just some paper that that for reasons we can go into, you think, well, that doesn't sound like there's not enough collaboration. Uh, so if you take out that pretty no, all of the data that are at high values of selectivity, and here this I didn't look at yet, uh, because that also seems unexpected, all are need more attention. That's then perhaps the politically correct uh, term right now. So whereas our membrane, our, our Dow DuPont commercial membrane that's here, kind of at a boundary of, of papers that I, I could easily dismiss as probably overly optimistic and things that I didn't look at yet, uh, that might be okay. And uh, so we did that. We are now going to do other ones. So I, I put more and more open membranes. I presume that's here. So I would think that 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 if we yeah, if we exclude all of those, that perhaps a real boundary right now is perhaps more here than than there. And that's actually good news for people making new membranes, like our first speaker, uh, for instance. You think you need to compete with this? No, you don't need to compete with a number on a website from a commercial vendor or a patent of 40 years ago, you need to compete with somewhere here. And if you do a little bit better, then, then you have a nice paper. So it's good news that we need to be critical of all these uh, published uh, numbers. So the conclusions, I would argue that we can do better than the standard parametrization with B, and it's not difficult to improve on that. Uh, so we pre pre uh, suggest a B double prime, there's a different unit than before. So the selectivity is now without dimension. That's also very nice. Uh, and that's good. And, uh, and now each membrane is one point in this diagram. And then you can better compare between membranes in different labs. So that's good. And you can use this theory to make uh, full-scale uh, RO plant calculations. And as I uh, suggested, I'm critical of uh, much of the 
input that went into this database ID. So the database concept and paper is nice, but perhaps not all the input is at the, at, at the same level of accuracy. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Very nice presentation. Um, um, before going to the uh, um, Q&A box, I would like to ask you, uh, the data that you have used uh, to verify your model, how accurate is that? Well, 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 it came from a very prestigious lab in the United States, uh, <laughs> and we're doing the same membrane actually also in Leeuwarden, but the, but the main point is that, that we did three salt concentrations and at each one five pressures, so all these 15 conditions and Duplo, so there's 30 data points that are all used to, uh, to, 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 to derive uh, this, arrive at this conclusion that's already a typical paper or a typical journal uh, website of a commercial vendor has one, one, one value of retention. So here we, so the, the idea is if you do this, you want to do it nicely, try to do perhaps 10 data points and see if it always gives you the same B double prime. Um, but yes, I mean, if, if it would be really different, if, if we make, made a big error, then perhaps my conclusion would have been that this power, for instance, the 0.4 is not 0.4, but 0.5. That's true, if, if that's the bit where you're hinting at. So it would be nice if people do similar exercise and say, well, I, I buy into the ID, but we find this power of you at 0.7 or point, and then we have, uh, then you can see which, which, which is better. So it's not, not, okay. not, so, not set so in this, stone. Yeah, go ahead. It's not set in stone, but the idea that we can do better than the standard approach that is definitely what I try to convince you of. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My question, because I saw just a few points for each uh, concentration, and it's a single salt, right? Yes, yes, yes. So for a different salt, it will be different. And if you do, yeah. uh, this morning it was also about, about uh, uh, asymmetric salts, and then we have whole seawater with the entire range of salts, so there's a lot of work that, that can still be done. But the most parametrizations and the characterization methods people use sodium chloride to characterize. And uh, my students actually, uh, whenever they say they see a model, they will ask me immediately, what is the significance? What is the meaning? What is the physical meaning of this constant? So what is the physical meaning of your N constant, this point four? Very good. Well, you have, you have good students. I love to meet them. Uh, very <laughs> philosophical and, uh, and scientific. So that's great and uh, congratulations. Uh, so no, so the power law correction, and I, I can explain that it's it's a fit through the full donan langmuir model, and that's two equations, and that they have to solve them iteratively, and that would. But then I, I discovered coincidentally that the simple. So I had a perfect fit. It, it, so I, I knew it worked. This donan langmuir model that relates to to proton adsorption to the membrane that works very nicely. And then it turned out that, the, that just a power law just perfectly fits all those data. And I can't prove it. So perhaps one of your students can help me prove why simple <laughs> power law does, but that's, that's purely empirical. So it's an empirical loss summary of an observation that, that a langmuir donna model for a proton adsorption to a membrane works. Okay, great. Uh, one question from uh, Dr. Faisal Rahman. Uh, he said, how to include the effect of pH in the model? Well, that, that's a lot of, that's a, <laughs> how much time do you have? Uh, so, so, uh, so as I, but you didn't know that at that moment, I, actually the pH in the membrane being different from in the feed water, that was, is part of my uh, reasoning of why membrane charge uh, goes down if you remove salt. So there is some kind of pH effect there. But indeed, uh, no, this model right now is just sodium chloride and symmetric. No, if, if, if you indeed want to include, for instance, how the feed pH uh, translates to a certain permeate pH, you need to model four ions and the reactions between H and OH, and then the reaction with the, the membrane, as I just mentioned. So, so actually my student, uh, Edward Kimani, uh, works on that. And it's, it's, it's always difficult because the sodium and chloride have high concentration, relatively speaking, to the proton and OH minus. Unless you are a very extreme pH, then suddenly, so sort of the permeate, we measure the permeate, 
uh, that actually the, 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 the sodium and chloride balance is not right. It turns out that indeed a significant portion of the cations in that particular mm -hmm. case is, uh, is, is protons. Uh, so, so, but that's challenging. So, so it immediately gets much more challenging if you go beyond uh, sodium chloride. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't see no more questions. So uh, I would like to thank you very much for being with us today again. And I would love to see you again more and more. Maybe next time you will join us over here in KFUPM. And very I would like to uh, thank all the speakers, uh, Professor uh, Kennedy, Professor uh, Victor, and Professor uh, Tang for being uh, with us uh, also. And uh, I will leave the floor if uh, uh, Professor Kennedy or uh, Victor want to add anything before we close this session. Just a uh, final thank you for the whole session. It was very interesting, great presentations, all different and all really informative. So I think I learned an awful lot this morning. So it was well worth logging in at eight o'clock. So thank you very much for that. And look forward to the next one. Yeah, we look forward yeah. also. Yes, thank you very much for this uh, webinar, very informative, uh, uh, as recent advances uh, was supposed to be. So, very well. Thank you. Well, thank you all uh, for being with us. It was uh, good to have you uh, uh, here. Uh, Dr. Yes. Jindi, uh, yes. I, saw, I saw that Abdul Wahid raised his hand. So, can you check? Maybe he has a question for, for Dr. Baishuel. Uh, Maybe. Okay, yeah, and now I see him. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Dr. Abdul Wahid. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, uh, I have a question actually uh, for uh, Professor Martin. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Uh, Thank you very much for such a nice uh, presentation and coming up with uh, the impact of salt interaction and uh, the charge on the membrane, and you included this in the new model. So I, I was just thinking that, uh, do you think the, if there is any effect of the thickness of the membrane? Any, uh, as you know, the salt has to ultimately pass through the membrane. So do you think that we should uh, look into this and include uh, the effect of thickness also? Well, that's very good point, of course. Uh, so in my simple model, a thickness is part of, 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 of what I call mass transfer coefficients, which indeed is a part of this, well, the old B, but also the new B double prime. So yes, thinner membranes have higher, uh, uh, well, well, thinner membranes have higher salt leakage. That's not good. Uh, so actually just from the point of, of keeping the salt out, the thicker is better. But then on the other hand, of course, the, the water fluxes go down. At the, if, if the main resistance is in the top layer for pressure drop, and I'm, I presume that's the case, but I, I don't know actually if the support layers not, not also have a quite significant pressure drop. Um, so making, but making them more open, then, then I think also the partitioning coefficients, the, 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 the exclusion because it, the iron doesn't fit also gets worse. So the iron then, so making the membrane more permeable is not a good idea. Making it thicker would, unless the, well, for selectivity, making it thicker in electrodialysis is actually exactly the same. Making it thicker is better if it's about keeping out the salt. Uh, but I, I, I would think the chemistry, you then have to go into the chemistry because it's, it's all a spontaneous process. So that, does that answer your question, uh, Abdul? But yes, it, yeah. Yeah, that, that is. That is enough. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you all for being uh, with us, uh, distinguished speakers and dear audience. And with this, uh, we will conclude our uh, workshop today until we meet next time, hopefully here in Saudi Arabia. Uh, all of you are uh, welcome. Uh, stay safe. Uh, thank you and uh, have a good day.